Many of us enjoy a refreshing swim in a backyard pool or a quick dip in a lake on a summer day. However, open water swimming can also be a competitive pursuit. But any time that we're swimming in open water, hypothermia can be a risk, either by itself or as a contributor to drowning. In today's episode, we'll take a look at what factors might contribute to increasing the risk for hypothermia during open water swimming competitions and how that might improve the safety of such events. Open water swimming as a competitive pursuit can come in many different forms. There's challenges such as swimming across the English Channel or even an ice mile in freezing water. There are also sanctioned open water swimming events such as the 10 km swim that's part of the Olympics. Then there's also swimming as part of multi-sport events like triathlons where the swim is 1500 meter and 3,900 meters in the Olympic and Ironman distances, respectively. Because of the high rate of heat loss in water, sanctioned races have cutoffs for cancellation in case the water is too cold, and also temperature thresholds at which wetsuits are either mandatory or allowed for racers to use. But because wetsuits also help you swim faster by also providing buoyancy, Above certain water temperatures, they are not permitted. But set temperature guidelines are one-size-fit-all measures and may not be that great in predicting individual responses. So are there specific risk factors that may predispose individuals to hypothermia during open water swimming? Drin Yi and colleagues studied this by tracking 9 males and 12 female competitors at the French Championships in 2019 who ranged in age from 15 to 32 years old. The race was 25 kilometers, or 10 laps of a 2.5 kilometer circuit, with feeding allowed every 1.25 kilometers. Water temperature on race day was just above the threshold where wetsuits would be allowed, so no competitors wore them. Racers age, sex, prior 25 kilometer swim competition experience, and body composition were determined beforehand. During the race, an ingestible pill tracked core temperature and speed was measured throughout. Here's a summary of the key findings. 7 out of 21 dropped out from hypothermia. Not surprisingly, the drop in core temperature in this group was greater than in the finishers. But what was interesting was that the hypothermic group dropped temperature very rapidly, much more so than the finishers. They were also much slower and dropped their speed much quicker, and also tended to have less body fat. And what was also interesting was that all seven hypothermic racers were first timers at the 25 km distance, and also that all of them were 18 years of age or less. Let's put this another way. If you were over 18 and had previously finished a 25 km race, you had no risk, in this study anyway, of dropping out due to hypothermia. This is of course just one study, and more work needs to be done to see if these patterns are really consistent. However, such data can help greatly with improving the safety of open water swimming events. This can be through better medical planning by organizers and medical staff, along with education of athletes and possibly screening out those at high risk. From this specific study, some potential actions may include changing wetsuit temperature thresholds, either for all competitors or possibly for first-time or junior racers. Also, the rapid core temperature drop in the hypothermic group at 2.5 kilometers means that support staff might be able to identify those at risk for hypothermia very early on, and that these racers might be the priority for closer monitoring throughout the race. I hope that you found this a refreshing dip into the fascinating world of environmental physiology. I'm Professor Stephen Chung, and I run the Environmental Ergonomics Lab in the Department of Kinesiology at Brock University in Canada. We post new episodes on different topics in environmental physiology every Wednesday. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.